Yes, this week we boldly go, inevitably, into that uh, often all-too-neglected section with the shiny covers at the back of the bookshop. Our two contenders are Brave New World, Aldous Huxley's vision of a future dominated by genetic engineering, a pretty near future, you might think, and Philip K. Dick's vision of a present controlled by a vast active living intelligence system, or Valis, as tonight's book is called. And here to argue their case are our two regular astronauts, advocates, <laughs> the broadcaster and journalist Mariella Frostrup <laughs> and the writer and performer Jack Claff. Now that applause comes from our studio audience who, as usual at the end of the programme, will be asked by me to choose which of these two books they would rather read, having heard the arguments from our two advocates. Now, Mariella, the received wisdom, I'm afraid, rather unfairly, is that women don't, as they say, do science fiction. What about you, Brave New World? That's such a personal question, Jim. <laughs> um, I'm sure there are lots of women who do science fiction. Um, I'm not generally one of them, but I wouldn't describe Brave New World as a pure sci-fi in any shape or form. I mean, there's no silly aliens, there's no absurd inventions, there's no drug-fueled fantasies. Instead, in, in Huxley's far-sighted story, uh, we draw the ultimate conclusion to the mass-consuming, self-pleasuring, genetically modifying society that we live in today. And it's a, it's a horrible, nightmare vision, all the more so because it's, it's fairly close to, to reality. And on top of that, and the fact that it's a classic, it's also wickedly funny and full of um, some amusing characters as well, well. I have a feeling you're going to be up against it tonight because I've uh, found in my pile here uh, none other than this, which is uh, bluff your way into the, in the quantum universe. And there's no name on the cover, but if you look inside, oh, it's him. Jesus, oh, um, right. Now, uh, I've got to ask why you wrote bluff your way in the quantum universe. Oh, oh, Jack, I'm so oh, disappointed Jesus. in you. Somebody asked me, somebody met me at a party and asked me, but you know, I mean, every week I bluff my way in literature, so it's the same kind of thing. Well, Philip K. Dick. Yes, Philip K. Dick. The thing about Philip K. Dick is he used to be way out there. Suddenly he's the big man in Hollywood with, bo with uh, books from which uh, movies were made, Blade Runner and Total Recall and Minority Report, and there's a new one coming out called Paycheck. The Matrix wouldn't have happened without him. So he's an incredibly, you know, happening now kind of guy. Uh, but this this one is, in a way, not science fiction in the it's sense... It's about that... God, not science, isn't it, in a way? It's, an, I mean. it's about God in a big way. And he's talking about uh, vast active living intelligence systems, rather like stuff that comes in through your ear right now. But the thing <laughs> is that, that the <laughs> oh, stuff that happens to him happens in a completely unexpected way in real life. In real life, he got a message from a, a song and it saved his son's life because he took his son to hospital as a result of that. He gets all sorts of str amazing blinding lights that Have turn him into God. he lost it in the same way that he did when he wrote this book? Because that's right. the longest introduction you've ever given. <laughs> well, <laughs> It's a kind of difficult book to describe, except to say difficult that... Difficult to read. It, well, I don't, I don't think it is difficult to Sorry, read. Jim. I think it's... Well, <laughs> I, I think it's wonderful to read, and it's informative, and funny, and very, very, very brilliant. And it sends you off to other things as well. I think this is going to be good. Who are your witnesses? My witnesses are John Dowie and Ken Campbell. <laughs> Indeed, John Dowie, formerly a comedian, well, once a comedian, always a comedian, but now more often thought of as a poet, a playwright, children's writer, and the completely unclassifiable national treasure, who is Ken Campbell. Uh, best summed up in one of his own descriptions, this one's marvellous. You may think I'm mad, but I've just read different books. Now, uh, Jack, I give you the opportunity to make some sense of that. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, John... Uh, we know uh, about your history with Philip K. Dick, or some, some people don't. Uh, uh, you actually took uh, uh, Philip K. Dick's book and you books and you turned them into a play. So what is it about him that grabbed you? A uh, quest for ultimate meaning. Um, peeling away uh, layers of reality to reveal the God that may or may not exist beneath those layers. And a couple of laughs. Yeah, he does. And a vague reference to drug material from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> Which always helps. And, uh, and the great love of animals and small, small life forms like rabbits. Right. He does say two things about God. One, God doesn't exist, and two, anyway, he's very stupid. No, he never said that. <laughs> he says it in fact. Well, well, he may say that in the course of the book, but I don't think that's the resolution he ends up with. 
So what kind of thing is the resolution for you? Because I, I understand that you see a lot of hope in this book. A lot of hope in all of his work, yeah. But I look for hope everywhere. If you weren't on this programme and somebody came to you and said, should I read this book and why? Could you actually say to them, you're going to have a really good time, or is Mariella right? Is it so dreadfully awful as an experience? Reading the book will lead you towards other things that will give you a good time, I would hope, yeah. <laughs> so the book itself is really, really horrible? And... No, no, the book itself is it's, it's a very strange and difficult book to read, uh, but once you have read it, then you're stuck with it. Because? Because it uh, plants a little seed in your mind, I suspect, and that seed will flower in the mind it grows in and lead that mind into other areas that will pre be fruitful to you. Is it like anything else in literature? Similar to the Holy uh, Bible. <laughs> without the uh, gory bits. <laughs> and without the tap dance at the end, I mean. Right. <laughs> and, and, and more laughs? More, more well, 50-50 on the laughs, I'd say. <laughs> Jack, it might be quite a good idea. We sort of know what happens in the Bible. Can we get from John sort of what Do happens we? in the book? I think that might help those who are trying to decide. Yeah, uh, that would be good. Well, it's, well, the first half of the book is, is, is autobiographical, and it's Philip K. Dick explaining to the reader, using the tools of science fiction writing, uh, trying to explain uh, a series of bizarre events that happened to him, which may be religious in nature, and he was never sure. Uh, he did a lot of, uh, lot of thinking and head-scratching over it, trying to find out what happened to him. As you said earlier, he had an experience where a, a beam of pink light uh, hit him and transferred him into uh, pre-Christian Rome, where he lived for a short period of time, rent-free, <laughs> and uh, then was returned to this reality. And, and spent the rest of his life trying to figure out what happened to him. So if you read Vallis, you'll find out about somebody's experience, some very strange and mysterious events. Jack, that's a very good moment in which to end, and I offer John Dowie to you, Mariella, with uh, good luck. I can hardly wait. John, I'm glad you said that the, the book itself wasn't up to much, because yeah, it's completely unfathomable, isn't it? At first, yeah, so is the sea, but it doesn't stop us going into Audience it. Audience noise is there. <laughs> they think it's deeply fathomable. They're coming from over there. We know where they are. You were saying? I have no idea. I was low moaning obscured my thought process. Uh, did you say what? It's hard to read. I hard, said, yeah. It. Well, no, you said it was hard to read. Yeah, yeah, I, was yeah, I, found, with I, I found it very hard to read when I first read it, but it didn't stop me reading it. And a lot of things are hard to read, but worth it. But what we're looking for here is, uh, out of the two books, which one is the best read? So if you wanted to recommend a book to a friend who wanted to enjoy themselves whilst reading a book, would you recommend Vallis? No, I'll probably recommend Radio Free Albemuth, which you wrote before <laughs> Vallis. Well, then you wouldn't be having them at all, would you? Because that's not a book. Oh, it's, 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 it's a companion piece to this. It is yeah. a book. The first book. Rule, it is it's a book. Before he wrote Vallis, he wrote a book called Radio Free Albemuth, which wasn't up to scratch, so he's been that, and he wrote Vallis. And after Vallis was published, after his death, they uh, republished Radio Free Albemuth, which is the same story told in a different way. D t tell me just a bit more about the book, because what troubled me, actually, more than anything else, was that it does start with a sort of autobiographical tale, and mm. then it descends into this quagmire of science fiction, which I think was a cop-out on his part, because I don't so think do I. he set out to write a science fiction book. No, he didn't. He didn't. It, but it, but it, what he set out to do was, was, was to transmit a message to as many people as possible. The message is King Felix. Uh, which I have now passed on, you'll have cleverly noted. <laughs> so you could have saved him the bother, and me the bother, of reading all of this. Well, if we had time out of joint, I could have done that. I mean, can I just say... Uh, <laughs> the one was and was not, combined and desired to separate the was not from the was. So it generated a diploid sack. Yeah, it's not one of his best gags, is it? Do you know what I mean? It's, it's hard going, isn't Don't it? Don't open with that at Glasgow, Philip. Don't open with that. Is that a quagmire or not? The audience will decide at the end. Jack, <coughs> your second witness. Same question. You've got somebody uh, who's asking you about this book and they're mm. saying, this, I, I want to know which book I'd rather read. Mm. What is it that, that makes Mariella's argument not work for you? Or is there another way of putting it? Is there a, a way in which you could recommend that someone read this book? I'd be very careful who this person was. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure that it's a very responsible thing to do at all. Right. To recommend valets. Exactly. Let me say this. Yes. Like, like, if you're likely to have a psychotic episode... Yes. You're much more likely to have one if you involve yourself with valets. Exactly. I don't think it's a... It's not a novel. It's not science fiction. It's, if you like, the proper name for this genre is recursive science fiction. I, it's a book 
about a science fiction author and the writing of science fiction. It's not a novel, it's a book. Right. What's it about? It's about, about. It's about, about this. It's about how nothing is about what it seems to be about. Right. And the structure of the book is roundabout. Yes. But then it goes shooting off. The structure is a cue. Now, the bit that you're complaining about is a bit when it cues off like yes. that. And you sort of talk about this um, regular part of it, you know, when you're on the, on the roundabout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's not cured, you see, because he's schizophrenic at the time of writing this book, Philip K. Dick. I mean, nobody's mentioned that actually the hero of the book is a guy called Horse Lover Fat. Exactly. Begins with this line. Horse Lover Fat's nervous breakdown began the day he got the phone call from Gloria asking if he had any Nambutals. And we carried on and on all about Horse Lover Fat. Uh, then, it suddenly, suddenly, uh, suddenly the, 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 Philip K. Dick writes about himself. I am Philip K. Dick, and this is a book about my friend um, Horse Lover Fat. Which is a and translation. Comes, yeah, but when we get to the, when we get yeah. to the num of it, uh, I mean, when he meets the two-year-old Jesus out on the Mexican border, that little girl, she says, uh, she says, yeah, well, this is a bit ridiculous, you know, because uh, Philip, in the Greek, means admirer of the equestrian arts, and Dick is the German for fat. Horse lover right? fat. And they go, oh, they become one person. But then he goes home and horse lover fat starts ringing him up from Tokyo and everything. I mean, gee, I mean, this is a damaging book. You take this book home, it's like taking home unexploded ordnance, some kind of cluster bomb. I mean, fine, I mean, you think it's, you think, oh, it's only £6.99, I'll have that, cheers. You don't just buy that, listen, you're going to have to pay 20 quid then to buy yourself the Nag Hammadi <laughs> Gospel. <laughs> exactly. Because you can't possibly have understood one third of it without your student of the Nag Hammadi lost Gnostic Gospels. And where's that going to lead you? I'll tell you where it's going to lead, and it's going to be potentially damaging for some. You're going to learn, in the words of Voltaire, that the creation of the world was by God's lowest angels, and that these, not being skilful, arranged matters as we see them. In Dick, you're going to get this. Is the universe irrational, and is it irrational because an irrational mind governs it? Yes, it is. The universe is irrational. The mind governing it is irrational. No point in getting into this unless you're going to involve yourself. And if you involve yourself, let me tell you, for me, it's gone on, whatever it is, 26 years. Starting I mean, I still wouldn't again. know well, all the things yeah. that are in it. It doesn't go. It barbs into the soul. It's exactly. A fissure, it barbs into the soul. And, readers, and it barbs the soul. I warn against it. Ken. <laughs> John. Endorse the warning, your witness. I don't really Welcome. think I need to ask him anything because he's made all my points for me. It is basically unreal. Yeah, I think it's very good. And I think it's very good. It? Listen, I think it's very good that you found it difficult if to read. Let me finish. Because I wouldn't want your type trampling in my book. <laughs> to oh. me, this book is my path. Oh. You know? And the Buddha is in the path. Don't lose saying, your audience, Ken. As what? I was saying, we're talking about an author who used to base his plot lines on the I Ching. I don't need to say any more. If you read the book, you'll end up like my friend Ken here. And if you, and if you read Brave New World, you may be able to have an intelligent conversation. We're not talking, of course, about whether it's an easy read. No, we're no talking one about could for a which moment book think would it's you an easy recommend, read. Jim? But it may be an experience that somebody would, would never be able to have in any other way. I thought you were supposed to be unbiased. Yes. No, I'm asking I'm you a question. I'm feeling slightly I'm like I'm you stuck question. in some uh, and Ken, side uh, a, quick, a quick point of Sorry, information. Sorry, just one point of information. If that's how he got his plot lines, it works for Hollywood big time. Big time. <laughs> Mariella, the last one. I've got absolutely nothing more to say on the subject. I thought it was a tedious book and... Um, I'd read Brave New World 70 times over rather than go through we'll it We'll be again. coming to Thank that you. in a minute. Thanks very much to Ken Campbell and John Dowie.